So yeah, uh, welcome uh, guys. Um, my talk today is going to be very nebulous. So it's, it scatters all over the place in the Cedar Grove region. It's a place where I've been uh, based in my research for the, well, since 2013. Uh, so I work on the Borkafell group, uh, which are these rocks over here. And the more I look into these rocks, the more I see, not just uh, paleontology, uh, but also archaeology and uh, local heritage that is still alive in the area today, and past heritage. So that's why it's titled uh, uh, Geomythology uh, and History of Scientific Inquest in Cedarburg, 40,000 years in the making. So that's, that's where I think it like all began. So when I talk about the Cedarburg, the Cedarburg um, forms part of this mountain chain that goes around the south coast of South Africa. This is the Cape Pole Belt. And the Cedarburg is located here in the most western extremities, just north of uh, Ceres. So we look at these rocks and outcrop. Uh, the geology of these rocks uh, comprises rocks of the Cape Supergroup. So we've got a very nice uh, succession, very nice and in depth uh, uh, paleontological and sedimentological record since at least the uh, middle to lower Ordovician right through into the lower Carboniferous. It's one of the few places in the southern hemisphere where one can get such a long-term uh, record of sedimentation. So in the field, it forms these very uh, beautiful cliffs and cliff faces and kranza and valleys. And really, if you, if you go there, you, you can just get, you'll, you'll get lost. Um, you, you won't want to come home. So um, very, very beautiful landscapes that these, these rocks form. So over here, this over here is AK Pass. This is Wolfberg Arch. This is the Maltese Cross. This here is Kroot uh, Rapier uh, That there is Farkloor. And this over here, this is Kroot Bat at Sunset. So yeah, very, very beautiful rocks. <laughs> so if we start with the Table Mountain Group, these comprise the lowest part of the succession. Uh, they were deposited somewhere between the uh, lower to middle division right through until the early Devonian. Um, and they like these very nice, they tend to be these very nice, coarse, super mature sandstones. It's pretty fossil poor. In places, there are trace fossils here and there. But when we go into the Cedarberg Formation, which is this sort of little marker mudstone bed that outcrops quite nicely along the uh, western arm of the Cape Fold Belt in the Cedarberg region. There are these fossils that one finds there. These fossils are unique. There are also very few places in the world that one can find these fossils. Uh, these are the Hanantian biota. So this is a paleogeographic map showing where South Africa was located during the Ordovician period. And here we were at low to temperate uh, regions. Um, um, the North Pole was up towards where North Africa is today. So what's odd is that these Hanantian fauna are generally associated with these high latitude conditions, but South Africa forms this very lower latitude part so, um, of this fauna. So again, it's very poorly studied, but there are very important fossils. Uh, this is just to show an outcrop, that's that middle marker swim bed, these pakes, these, these tillites. So for some reason at this time period, glacial conditions extended to lower latitude. And the fossil fauna over here are amazing. Um, so you think it was deposited in a pro-glacial, shallow marine uh, type setting. And in places, the Swim and Dicer members of the Cedarberg Formation are exceptionally rich in fossils. So we've got these very early jawless fish, these conodonts. This over here is just to show in this picture over there. It's very fuzzy. It's, it's, it's a 1.4 scale. Here are the two little eyes, and here are the jaw elements of this conodon called this is Pulcrum. Uh, if it wasn't for this fossil, I mean, conodonts are pretty, um, pretty abundant right through into the Triassic. But if it wasn't for this fossil, we wouldn't know what this organism looked like. So it's a very important fossil. Yeah. Uh, there are also these very early sea scorpions, some trilobites, lobopods, which if you can imagine, they uh, jelly babies with many legs. That's how you can describe them. Um, so yeah, and also as well, possibly the earliest sort of uh, plant spores that indicate a move towards terrestriality of plants at this, uh, at this time period. So it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting um, set of, of group of rocks or members. So this is to show you 
what the landscape would have looked like. We would have had these ice sheets that moved out into the Cape Basin as the ice melted. The sediment, you could imagine, uh, ice forms a barrier, the sheet forms a barrier uh, to the deep marine environment. And any dirt or sand that was on top of these sand sheets, as the glaciers melted, it would fall down and smother and bury these animals. So this is why we've got such exceptional preservation. So I'm going to skip through onto the Borkapal group where I work. Um, so the Borkapal group is also a very nice succession from uh, that record sedimentation from the early Devonian right through to the middle Devonian period. So what they look like in the field of these rocks, it's very laterally continuous mudstones and sandstones. Um, and their fossil fauna are also just as exceptional. So there are these highly endemic trilobites that one finds there, uh, that are found in very few places in southern Botswana. Endemic brachiopods, which um, I study, some uh, chinoderms. Yeah, you can see like there's a little uh, ophiroid, you see its arm sitting on a, a head of one of these trilobites. So, and then also these very uh, early jellyfish type animals. So at this time period, South Africa shifted Remember I said in the um, Ordovician we had these low latitudes. Now the South Pole shifted down towards where, you know, where we are. We were situated very near the South Pole. So these animals are also just as exceptional. Uh, these fossils are just as exceptional in that um, we've probably got the best record of these fossils in uh, southern Gondwana. If you go into South America, it's vegetated over. In Antarctica, there's ice sheets. And in the Falkland Islands, in places, you can't get to the good outcrops because there's still landmines there from the Falklands Fall. And so you really have the best um, over here. These are such a lack of a to study. Uh, what we also have are very early fish. So at one stage, the earliest known fossil shark was known from the Borkapal group. This is a shark called Puka Pampella. Um, this, of course, is its uh, the skull. There are also these. Um, Placoderm fish, that one, these are just reconstructions that one finds, as well as these early Sarkoff region fish, um, as well as Anchorthodians. So there's, you know, this, even though we're at, at, at high latitudes, life still found a way down south. Um, we, you know, these animals really like this condition. Now, these conditions, I think, it's because nothing could eat them, or very few things could eat them. But again, you know, it feels horrible, you know, having to brag the whole time. I feel pompous on behalf of the rocks. <laughs> but some of the earliest known plant fossils known from Africa are on our doorsteps. These very simple rhinoxid type um, uh, fossils and, and lycopods. Yeah, this is a lycopod impression. And yeah, we still have, these are modern day lycopods uh, that have really much been in stasis since the Devonian period, since about 400 million years. Nothing much has changed. So it's a very successful bow plan. So, you might ask, how did we know all this stuff? Um, how did we acquire it? And um, it's a good way to look at the science news, uh, but slowly, slowly, creeping on from point to point. As Alfred Lord Tennyson uh, says, or as my former supervisor Bruce says, Vicky, Vicky, Mark, Bayer. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it, it's taken a long time, and as I'll show you, it's taken you less than about 40,000 years ago. So this is pretty much a summary of a paper that we published that came out earlier this year that describes these very early um, fossil discoveries and the history of research in the Borkapal group. Um, so you guys can find it in this paper, or just email me, I'll send it to you. So we know from uh, the early fur trekkers and trek boers that moved through the area, through the Cape, as the Cape and the Cape Colony was founded. Um, merchants and missionaries that were out there. These guys in these records, these are just a few records that I've actually managed to get a hold of, have all spoken about how they have encountered, encountered fossils in the uh, Cedarburg region, specifically in what we think is probably the Borkapal group region, uh, since as early as 1800. So the earliest record that we have, um, this is why I wrote this paper, it was a uh, first description of fossils as such from the Borkapal group were by uh, Latrobe, so the Reverend, uh, Reverend uh, Latrobe in 1818, 200 years ago. He describes um, at a place in Antiquus Plouffe, as, uh, as Sherrod mentioned earlier, that he found these 
fossils that look like screws. And from his description and the general geology of the area, he must have been looking at these fossils, which are, uh, which are fossil tentaculates. So they're very basal uh, type mollusks. We're not really sure if they are uh, like cephalopods or something different altogether. So he, uh, he was the first person to actually write something about fossils in the Cape of Peru, as well as mention um, uh, who was the first uh, finder of fossils, and he refers to a chap by the name of John Ensley, um, who was a former merchant from, the, uh, from Cape Town, and he reckons that John Ensley was the first person to find fossils somewhere between 1804 to 1806. Um, in Latrobe's book, he, he mentions notes that were left by John Ensley, but I can't seem to find them, and he actually describes it. Um, other source of information is from uh, Tom, so uh, the Reverend Dr. Tom. He mentions that a lot of the um, early uh, fur trekkers and settlers, Dutch settlers in the area, would actually construct their houses with these fossiliferous blocks. So these are these uh, sandstones that one uh, finds in the valleys, quite big blocks with impressions of fossils. So these are very faint, these ones that I found of some brachiopods. There is a bivalve, there's another tentaculator, and there is another bracket. <coughs> so he says that, um, you know, of course the Dutch have known of uh, fossils in this area since as early as 1750, um, and the earliest homesteads in the Cedarburg region were established. So it pushes it back to 1750 in this case. Um, Dr. Andrew Smith, the founder of the Zippo um, Museums, is often very uh, he's forgotten. Um, but people who came in contact with Andrew Smith, when you read their diaries, they always say that Andrew Smith, he amassed a huge collection of fossils uh, from the Cedarburg region, and uh, those fossils, no one knows where they went to. When he went back to the UK, he probably took them with them and sold them off. But we don't have any real record of it. Um, or we don't even know if he took the fossils in the first place. But he is very important that he founded the Zebra Museums, uh, where the largest uh, collection of book of material is housed. So uh, I know this is a debate among with my, my co-authors with uh, the current paper that we're writing, is who described the first fossil and uh, when was it? Um, so the earliest record that I have uh, from the book of group is the description of a trilobite. This is of a thorax and a pygidium a trilobite called Burmeisteria Hershelli by, uh, uh, by Murchison in 1839. He, um, he described this fossil, we named it after the famous Sir John Herschel of an you know, astronomer at the Royal Observatory in Cape Town. So this is where the sort of, we're getting to the stage now where um, the more formalized descriptions are coming. So during this time period as well, other mythologies uh, uh, came about in the Cedarburg region, and they still are rampant to this day. You can't actually, I've tried asking locals um, you know, that are really, really deep in the mountains uh, to you know, never been to Cape Town, where they get all these terms and terminologies and uh, descriptions from, and uh, they don't know. It's just so entrenched. So the first of these things called the Davis of Fitzwater, so these are these lycopod impressions, and uh, so they have reasoned that oh, these men are the bicycle tracks left by the devil. <laughs> but these aren't, these are lycopod impressions. Unfortunately, it would be cool to see you know, the devil uh, trucking in, in those mountains. I guess it's, it's warm enough for you uh, to enjoy it. The next uh, are these uh, the Davis of Dolstian, so the devil's dice. So um, one finds these cubes in the field, but they're of laminite, it's an alteration on the papyri. So, you know, the devil really gets around, he's a bicycle, a gambler, man, you know, he's, he's you know, he's got the monopoly over there uh, as such. So, uh, these are some mythologies that are still rampant to this, that it would be great if we could actually track down where they came to first, or came from first. But what I think we have to be most proud of in, in, in uh, the Cedarburg region, and also as South Africans as well, is that we've got evidence of the, uh, possibly the earliest fossil curation right at the latest Stone Age level. So indigenous peoples that were in the region before, um, uh, before settlers came to the Cape obviously knew of these fossils. 
it would be interesting to know how these fossils play into their mythologies. So uh, this is a famous example of a trilobite that was uh, uncovered in 1991 by Miller, and it's of a uh, homolomotor, Burmasteria Shelley, that was found in association with a whole bunch of other little treasures, stone tools, hematites, crystals, uh, quartz crystals, etc. And it's found, they're found over 10 kilometers away from the nearest outcrop. So these people obviously, you know, whether they were interested in them, uh, like we all are, because we all, we all are by nature curious, or if it played into their mythologies, we, we don't really know. But since then, uh, we have documented an additional two new sites, which when our paper gets accepted, we will uh, share with all. So I don't, I'll rather leave uh, Charles to talk about that. So we should be very, very proud of this, especially. You know, South Africans, we, you know, we can brag so much and feel bashful doing this. Um, but it's also very interesting is that the geology of the Cedarberg region also forms the backdrop for other archaeological sites. So the Cedarberg region uh, work that at ECRAG um, are doing, um, so Jeanette Deacon uh, and her uh, colleagues, as well as Cape Nature, they have documented all of these, they're trying to document this, all these cave painting sites in the region. So we think that these cave paintings are from about 100,000 years up to about 2,000 years old. It's in excess of 2,000 recorded sites. Um, and this makes it probably the most, um, the most populated place uh, on Earth to put uh, uh, rock paintings. And these people also that made these paintings obviously knew something about the geology and that they would always select super mature sandstones in the Table Mountain and Pittsburgh groups. So you never find them in the Bokkafal group. They are always in specific sandstones. And once you get your eye in, you, they pop up everywhere. Um, so we'll move on now in terms of more formal scientific uh, inquest. Um, so with these initial reports, this, you imagine these, these initial reports and also the expanding Cape Colony, a lot of activity through the area. Um, prolific road builder uh, by the name of Andrew Gillies Bain made his way through South Africa or Southern Africa to the Cape Colony and sort of mapping out these rock units as well as uncovering uh, fossils along the way which he described in association with Daniel Sharp and John Salter. So this single piece of work is, um, is amazing and it really opened the floodgates for, for further research. So these are just some uh, fossils that were described by these chaps. And this here is Bain's uh, geological map. Um, so the dates on some of these maps are seen in some credit to 1845, others to 1852, but the publication only came out in 1856. So I guess snail mail was the thing getting this uh, reviewed. So I guess we can't complain that much. You can wait six months for a paper or longer. <laughs> so, um, and this geological map up here is really something to, to marvel at. Um, if I could, I would. Uh, print one for every classroom in the country is that this is really groundbreaking stuff um, at a time period as well where not many countries more developed nations did not even have geological maps so this is one of the earliest very well detailed maps um, and yeah later on with the formation of the geological commission of the Cape Good Hope these guys here, Corsifin, De Toy, Rogers and Schwartz, of course have been Urubitsi, he was one of the first heads of school, the old Kimberley School of Mines. So I guess we've got some bragging rights up here that we've got one of our own wikis here. And they did a lot of groundbreaking uh, work, especially uh, Ernest Schwartz, uh, in looking at uh, endemism of fossils, how these fossils are related to other localities of the same age in southern Gondwana. Um, ideas of sedimentology, uh, lithostratigraphic frameworks, etc. Um, and then other paleontologists, Reed, Seward, uh, Lake, Clark, and Rennie, who were also prolific during this period of the year. So we'll fast forward through until more, more recent times. Um, so, with all of this that was being done, South Africa was proclaimed a republic in 1961. There was a big drive for resources um, since we were pretty much were pariahs. Um, so groundbreaking work was done by uh, Prof. Tolliard at uh, Stellenbosch University and uh, with these guys there, Rist, Teron, and Lohr, they went and they re 
did the Cave Supergroup as well as Mike Johnson. So this work was done supported through SUPOR, Petroleum Resources, as well as the Committee for Street Security. So they did also a hell of a lot of good work, which is, which is relevant right through to this day. Other workers uh, were based abroad, so Ken Pastor, Peter Isaacson, and Mark McCoe uh, reassessed a lot of these paleontological finds and they really um, hit the nail on the head and uh, said, look, what you guys have got is very important um, in form looking at uh, this, this region of endemism, the Malvino Capri ground. So they did a, a lot of work, um, which is again still relevant. Uh, more recent times, um, it's just been pretty much reviews of, of paleontological uh, data or, or fossils. So there have been revisions of trilobites by Mike Cooper, um, revisions to lithofascist models, paleoecology models, as well as intense fossil collected, intensive fossil collected by Roy Westhazen. So if you have got a Zika museum, if you ever handle any book from material, he found it. So, Roy Westhazen is one of the single greatest fossil collectors, um, not just in the Bulk Park group, but in South Africa. Um, then, yeah, again, more recent work that has been done. Uh, first description, description of ostracods, which uh, we're still trying to assess if they have any biostratigraphic importance, so this correlate stuff. Description of fish, John Almond, who's been around, um, he's also collected a, a hell of a lot of fossils um, in Group. Description of the oldest known at this time period, oldest known shark, uh, was in the late in the early 2000s. Uh, this important brachiopod fossil of the air sort of is, is something that we think is uh, indicative of an extinction event, as well as these multi platforms which are like cartons, and this is probably the oldest known multi platform So, um, yeah, I won't go into that as well as uh, not many people like that. So, work that I've been doing with colleagues, um, I've been looking at reassessing the sedimentology, stratigraphy, and paleontology of the area. I've been working on um, sea level curves, so looking at controls over sedimentation and fossil distributions, um, along with Rob Guest. Rob Guest has done some exciting work. We found uh, Africa's first and only known tetrapod, earliest forests, earliest known lamprey, as well as earliest known carapods and arthropods. Um, other workers, Barry Reed from UCT, she has done some quite exciting work where she CT scans these blocks and looks at ophiroids inside the actual uh, fossil block itself, so using new non-invasive techniques. And then also we're looking at uh, extinction events, which none are known from these high latitudes during the Devonian period. So for future research, uh, I think one thing that we should look at is looking to local indigenous people as well as um, uh, farmers in the area that have been in this area for, for a long time. You know, you, you go into anywhere into the crew of Cedarburg and you ask the farmer what he thinks of the land, the lay of the land. He knows the land better than geologists, uh, or she does, um, better than anyone else does. So we actually need to go and document these mythologies because there are probably more that we don't know about. But all that's also exciting during the, the Devonian period is how South Africa fits into this, this picture. So this is just showing an equatorial view where we were, um, southern most extremities. Uh, during this time period, again, earliest plants were there, we've got them. Earliest forests, we've got them. Um, arthropods, we are finding them. Um, ammonoids, we have yet to find them. Uh, fish, we've got them. Um, You've also got these other ancient orders that uh, need to be looked at. You know that some of them died by the end of the Devonian period. Why did they die? And also, as well, we're starting to elucidate now the evolution of tetrapods and how they moved to eventually onto land. So the Devonian period is, is really a great place to work. Um, there's a lot of stuff that can be done. So in short, um, there, there isn't an end to this. It's just going to go on for, for a very long time. So, yes, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank FAST, EST, NRF, Sense of Excellence in Paleosciences, as well as Fitz, Fitz Geosciences, and all my other sponsors. Uh, you guys have been good to me, and um, I hope I don't disappoint you guys. I just, I just want to talk about the rocks. Um, that's, that's it, and that's what makes me happy. So, thank you. <laughs>